Thanks again. <clears throat> it's great to be back to have a GYN session here. Um, I'm going to cover uh, Overy, uh, and um, uh, they've asked me to cover frontline maintenance, recurrence resistant, recurrence sensitive, and novel therapeutics in 30 minutes. So I'll uh, try to uh, stick to some high level points. And I put some summary slides in here to help uh, kind of keep us oriented. Is, um, by way of disclosures, um, I'm going to talk about uh, several trials that are ongoing yet. So these will be off labeled use um, for several compounds. And I have I serve as a PI for trials that, that, are, that are working with uh, different companies through the, either the NCI or through the companies through themselves uh, from Genentech, Amgen, Merck, and Novartis. So um, <clears throat> with regard to ovarian cancer, you know, I think a lot of people get the sense that this is a, a really uncommon disease. And it is by the numbers. If you look at incidence rates, it's actually not that common. But one of the things that, we'll, that I'll show you in, this, in the next slide is that this is a disease for which we have a lot of patients around in different phases of treatment. In fact, although we say there's about 20 or so thousand patients a year, 20 to 24,000 patients a year with ovarian cancer newly diagnosed, there's about 200,000 women with the disease, with that diagnosis, who are under various different phases of therapy. So that gives us the opportunity to see, uh, these patients get to see a lot of, in this country, a lot of treatment, and they get seen by a lot of, um, uh, in a lot of courses of therapy. And you can see just the numbers globally. Um, if you translate that into three and five year survivorships, um, you're probably talking close to three quarters of a million to a million women in the world that have this disease. We know that it gets, it's, um, uh, it is, the burden of disease is greater in um, developed countries, this is largely because a lot of, in underdeveloped countries we see diseases like um, cervix cancer from the GYN that are much more of a, of a burden. We know that the incidence increases with age and most of the patients are still diagnosed with advanced stage disease and the risk of relapse is, is high. So this is the kind of natural history of this disease. I've kind of put it out here so you can kind of see where the decisions are. We see these patients with symptoms, um, diagnosis and staging, uh, or the bulking is, is made at that point. That little slit in the middle um, here uh, is where we considered interval cytoreduction or neoadjuvant therapy if patients get induced with chemo first, then go to surgery and get chemo since. At that point, we usually do some type of evaluation. Um, we don't do second look laparotomies anymore um, because it's felt not to be a very good diagnostic tool and has no prognostic um, significance um, in terms of identifying new, new therapies for this at this point. Then there's this, this thing called maintenance, and I'll talk to a little bit about what's going on in that box. The spring is here until time of progression. Patients in this country go on to, on average, five different courses of, or cycles of, or courses of therapy after progression um, until, um, um, until they go into supportive care. Unfortunately, from this point on until uh, the end, the time clock is really going. We don't, so we don't salvage patients uh, in long-term cures after they recur. Um, we do have patients that are many years out with on and off disease, but we don't um, actually cure patients uh, very frequently in that scenario. What's really interesting is that in the last five years or 10 years or so, what we've seen is that the second half of the curve before progression and the, from progression on is, um, is about the same as the time to the first progression. So women are living much, much longer uh, in post-progression than they are, um, than we had seen in previous, tri uh, previous um, uh, years. And this uh, is very difficult for us to deal with from the standpoint of trials looking at overall survival because there are many different things that confound progression-free survival statistics because of what happens in this, in this time frame from here. And as you can see, the range is from 12 to 38, 38 months, depending on the types of patients that go into the trial. Now, if you've never seen ovarian cancer, this is what it looks like. I think I stole this from, um, from Brad, who stole it from somebody else. Um, it makes its way around nicely. But it's a good example of what our, what our uh, issue is. <clears throat> if a tumor, if you see a patient who has a, <clears throat> a large intraperitoneal tumor and you can resect that and there isn't a lot of peritoneal spread, that's, no, that's not a problem. The problem is how much time do you spend trying to take off each one of these little, you know, three millimeter plaques? And you can see they're spread all over. Here's the uterus down here. All this is disease. It's in the mesentery. It's on the peritoneal surfaces. And so <clears throat> while our goal is to try to get as much of this disease out as possible, you can see what the challenge is at the time of surgery. Now, there's a lot of rationale to do debulking in, in ovarian cancer. Um, it's one of the few diseases for which we think that there's a, there is a role for, for, for cytoreduction. 
as many of you know, who treat colon, breast, and other tumors, um, there's been almost a move away from doing um, aggressive primary cytoreduction. reduction. But in ovarian cancer, because of the large, large volume of disease, this is several kilograms of tumor frequently. It's um, generally poorly perfused and hypoxic. It induces a large amount of heterogeneity. Um, it's genetically unstable. It's eliciting multiple different tracks of survival mechanisms. And so we feel that if we can get a lot of this out by just physical removal, we will, in a sense, potentially add, put more cells into the growth cells, into the growth cell cycle, allowing them to be more sensitive to chemotherapy. And that's been kind of the traditional view of things. Um, but we do know that these tumors um, have their own innate biology and work from the, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project and others have shown that even within high-grade serous cancers, there are different phenotype or genotypes which do relate to different phenotypes in terms of their ability to be debulked. And so I put down there the practical, is, is this a biology experiment or is this a um, physical effort um, and intention, attention to, to um, a resection effort? And that question is still ongoing, despite the fact that we have good data on both sides. So as Brad mentioned, um, <clears throat> the definition of optimal is changing. Uh, in the past, we'd always in, in, the initial uh, de uh, de description of how debulking related to outcome was made by Dr. Griffiths in 1975 in a monograph in the NCI. There, they showed that um, less than two and a half, one and a half centimeters of residual disease, those patients did better than patients who had left with larger than one and a half centimeters disease. Then we went to two centimeters, then one. And I think what's happened in the last couple years with analyses like this from the AGO group that combined um, about 3,000 patients from various studies that showed no effect of chemotherapy, they were able to show a very striking difference on the amount of outcome based on residual disease. And as you can see here, if you take the whole patient group that's less than one centimeter, that would include this red and black curve, they're going to do better than the blue curve, which are those patients left with more than one centimeter disease. But the big difference is the patients that are left with no visible residual. We call this R0. So you may see that in your right in reading um, with ovarian cancer with regard to um, types of patients going into the study. R0 are those patients that are rendered visibly disease-free. Those patients do substantially better than patients that are left with any residual. And what's interesting is that patients that are left in more than one centimeter, there's very little difference if they're left with 1.5 centimeters or 10 centimeters. So those patients have very similar types of outcomes. So we think that if, it's, if a patient is worthy to go to surgery, we ought to do the best job we can. And not, many times that involves multi-organ resection, including bowel, spleen, liver, et cetera. Now, you can look at these curves and say, well, listen, the R0 patients are the ones that come in with the solitary nodule and the momentum, and you take it out, done. And there's some, there's some, there's some truth to that. Um, these things are not, if, these are not necessarily sorted out by that. And there was a study, I didn't put it in the slide deck for a matter of time, but there was a study that was done that looked at the, um, the experience in the GOG where they were able to look at types of procedures required to get to R0, and they were able to show that, um, that um, in patients um, that required extensive um, surgical cytoreductive procedures to get to R0 didn't do that much different than patients that were essentially had an easy R0 outcome. So it's still debated, and, we're, and without prospective randomized trials, it's very difficult to, um, to do it, and you could say that these are essentially be un unethical. So the other idea is that, well, maybe we can induce the chemotherapy, induce these tumors because we know they're chemosensitive, shrink the volume down, then take them to surgery because we ought to be able to do a better job of surgery with less tumor volume. And that was really the focus of this randomized phase three trial. Now, we've all had ex this experience. Um, I had a pa this is a patient of mine who came in who, as you can see, has massive liver disease, um, necrotic, um, massive ascites. She had very large volume of disease. She had cardiovascular problems. Um, she actually had an MI. Um, she was then treated with uh, single agent chemotherapy for a cycle while she got her stents placed. Um, then she had two, uh, three more cycles of chemotherapy. And then she came back and saw me. And this is what her CT scan looked like. Dramatic response. In fact, when I took her to the OR to debulk her, this little thing back here was her only peritoneal implant. So when you see these types of things, you believe that, you know, this, you know I certainly wouldn't be able to get her to R0 at this point, um, and here was easily to get to R0. So when you see that kinds of things, it does support the idea that maybe you can, this, this induction therapy might have a role. So uh, Ignaz Vergoat did this study. They randomized patients who were stage 3, 4. These were pretty heavy volume disease patients. 
One, half of them went to surgery, half of them went to chemo, and then they had their surgery as an interval, and you can see the outcomes. Absolutely no difference between the curves of, uh, based on the approach of therapy. Now, this study has been criticized. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It took a long time to get published. There was a lot of resistance in this country. I was a reviewer in this article as well. The, the, uh, the, the supplementary material is 55 pages long. So there was a lot of questions about the uh, appropriateness, the uh, ability to, to interpret this data to all audiences. And one of the major issues that we've had with this study is that the total overall cytoreduction reduction rate to, to what we would consider optimal was very low. And so, uh, and it varied widely by countries, from double, uh, essentially half in, in some countries to double in other countries. So um, while this is a, the first and only randomized trial that we have in this particular scenario, it's still considered um, a controversial topic and uh, more work is still ongoing. In fact, there are three trials right now that are actually out there that are trying to address this question embedded in multiple different um, um, sub-trials. So uh, not all of them have that as their primary endpoint, but they all have ideas of new adjuvant chemotherapy based on, based on different outcomes. And these trials are in your handout. Now, after surgery, we've got to make a decision. Um, and many of you chose Pactaxacar Platinum as your preferred choice for adjuvant therapy. Well, that story began in 1991, uh, 1990 actually, with the launch of the study, GOG 111. Uh, it was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1996. You can see it showed for both progression-free and overall survival, there was a difference, a significant difference in outcome. And this led to the standard of paclitaxel as a 24-hour infusion and cisplatinum at 75 milligrams per meter squared as the standard of care. And essentially with a solitary trial, overnight, the standard of care changed. And then a week later, we changed it all to an, to an outpatient regimen with carboplatinum substitution for cisplatinum, and we went to three-hour paclitaxel for 24-hour paclitaxel because we had all this data in the recurrent setting that those two were equivalent. And of course, for the last decade, we'd shown that carbo and cis were equal in ovarian cancer, so we just made the switch. Well, the actual confirmation that it was not an inf that the car taxol carbo um, it was not inferior to paclitaxel cisplatinum came in this trial, GOG 158. You can see was published seven years later, although it was already the community standard by the time um, this data came out. You can, this was a non-inferiority trial. It showed that the paclitaxel carboplatinum was not inferior to the uh, paclitaxel cisplatinum and it confirmed our over overwhelming bias that this was the appropriate regimen. But in the background, we had three positive phase three trials for overall survival using intraperitoneal disease in patients with small volume residual. So the definition of small volume residual changed a bit between the trials, but in um, the, the latter two that involved the paclitaxel-based regimen, GOG-114, and this trial, GOG-172, you can see with this particular regimen, uh, with the uh, day two or day one, day two, day eight, with the paclitaxel given both IV and IP on a weekly schedule, with cisplatinum at 100 per meter squared, that there was not only a progression-free survival difference, but there was an overall survival difference, and the first trial to breach five years on the median overall outcome. So here we had a clear representation that in patients with optimal disease resection, that intraperitoneal therapy was better than intravenous therapy. Now, this has, of course, had some controversy. A lot of people look back at this standard and say, well, you know, this isn't really our standard. But I just showed you that it, did not, it was, not in, was not a superior regimen uh, to the uh, Pactaxel carboplatinum backbone. Other people said, you know what, <clears throat> most of these patients didn't realize all, didn't get all their therapy because it was too toxic. True. A lot of these patients didn't. But we found in subsequent studies that if they got all five, study, all five or six um, regimens, intraperitoneal, these patients did substantially better substantially better. And we also found that patients that had uh, BRCA, um, uh, lack of BRCA expression in their tumors actually also did substantially better. So there's a lot of love here if you can get this stuff in and learn how to give it because it is very effective. But as a rule, we don't like it because it's, an eight, it's a three infusion. Um, you can see the Paxil was given over 24 hours and we've all modified it. The question is, will it still hold up? Well, one of the ways to try to um, breach that good outcome that we saw was to try to add an additional therapy. So this is a, just a slide of all of the regimens, uh, phase three trials that have been done that have tried different strategies to try to add new therapy without going the IP route. And as you can see, at the sum total of 11,000 patients, absolutely no difference was seen with this particular strategy. 
So our next phase was to try to move the bar using some alternative strategies. And you can see I've left IP therapy in there because we haven't gotten away from it. We're trying to make it better because we think that there's some role for it in this disease. But um, I'll show you what kinds of ways that we're trying to modify it. The first kind of um, therapy that we use to move the bar is dose-dense therapy. This was the uh, Japanese GOG trial, which was being done. While we were studying biologics in this country, they were studying dose-dense therapy. You can see that Pacotaxol is given at a dose dense in the weekly, dose intense. You can see that it's also given at 80 versus um, 60, so there's a 33% increase in the total dose of the, med the medicine that was administered. And this trial was done in, in, a, in an Asian population, stages two to four, including clear cell and high-grade serous. And you can see their stratification was also for cytoreduction of less than one centimeter or greater. <clears throat> what they showed in their long-term uh, results, that, which have been, their short-term results have been published, their long-term results have been presented. These are the long-term results with 6.4 years of follow-up. The PFS curves are dramatically different. And in this particular study, the progression-free survival is extended by 11 months. 11 months. We have no trial to date that has shown that much difference. In overall survival, the median outcome in the, in the experimental arm has not been reached with 6.4 years of follow-up. As you can see, at five years, there's 59% of the patients um, had not um, progressed uh, or had not died on this, on this therapy. Now, this is a very interesting study, and it, it makes you believe that dose density has a role, and I do personally believe it has a role. But you've got to remember that the Asian patient population does better, and we've actually t sorted this out um, as well in our IP therapies and shown, again, that the Asian patients do better on, um, uh, yeah, with, this type, with these strategies of therapy than do uh, the non-Asians. Now, what the, eight, what the Japanese are doing is that they're going to say, okay, dose dense is good, so now let's try the IP part. So they're going to try to combine their two winners, which is um, this particular trial called the IPOC trial, which is ongoing, and it's basically just changing the carboplatin from IV to IP, as you can see in the experimental arm. Now, in the, um, in the U.S. and other places, we were working on um, um, biologics therapies, GOG 218, published in, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, December of 2011, was a randomized three-arm trial looking at Pacotax platinum backbone uh, with placebo given during chemo and during maintenance, a second arm giving bevacizumab during chemo but not during maintenance, and a third arm giving it during chemo and during maintenance. And you can see the duration and the dose of the bevacizumab that was given there. This was a trial that was initially open to suboptimal in stage four patients, but then it was um, amended in June of uh, 2007 to allow patients with optimal disease uh, that was macroscopic, and uh, they were allowed to be enrolled into the trial. Overseas, the ICON-7 was going on at the same time. It was a trial that was similar designed. You can see there's a lack of an ARM-3. The experimental arm has bevacizumab given during the chemotherapy and during maintenance. There's no placebo control. The dose of Bev is half and the duration of infusion of the, of the biologics um, therapy was, was reduced. They also included patients with stage one disease, um, and um, <clears throat> you can see, as I mentioned, there's no placebo control, but 1500, over 1,500 patients on this trial. And very interestingly, these trials came to very similar conclusions. The experimental arm um, three on the GOG-218 was positive uh, compared to the control arm with, a, with an addition of about four months on progression-free survival, the hazard ratio of 0.73. In the ICON-7, the progression-free survival has improved about two and a half months with um, hazard ratio of 0.87. Both of these are statistically significant. However, neither of them showed a difference in overall survival. So this is the, um, on GOG-218, this is about um, nearly about Half of the events um, um, have been uh, registered, so there's, there's not as much censoring. And in ICON-7, this is the latest data <clears throat> that was reported, although we are going to hear an update on this uh, overall survival curve um, uh, shortly. Now, one of the interesting things that came out of these two trials was that there seemed to be a, um, a difference of the effect while patients were on therapy, and it was not constant. So we call that a non-proportional hazards. Um, and so because of that, there was a different analysis called restricted means analysis that was done to try to put some context into what was the effect during the therapy. And that's what these bottom two curves are. These bottom two curves are the um, effect of the experimental arm relative to control. And you can see that in both trials, GOG-218 and ICON-7, that when the biological agent was stopped, the effect was rapidly lost. And that led to the hypothesis that maybe we just didn't treat long enough. And so 
GOG 1262 is a trial for which that's going to be allowed. So in this particular trial, we have the dose-dense um, strategy again with bevacizumab and the, against the Q3 weekly schedule in patients with suboptimal disease, and they are given Bev in, with maintenance until progression. And in reality, this is probably the only population that we can realistically do this kind of a strategy because some of the patients in frontline are, ne are cured with their frontline surgery and their chemotherapy. And to treat them forever on bevacizumab um, or any agent at that, for that matter, I, it becomes, becomes problematic. The other trial in the GOG that's um, now complete, we're waiting results, um, is a, um, in, the op in the optimal patient population, looking at dose-dense um, therapy with bevacizumab dose dense with intraperitoneal carboplatinum with bevacizumab, and a modification of that GOG-172 trial I showed you with bevacizumab, all these with bevacizumab maintenance. And there are other trials that are ongoing. Um, Nintentinib, or the LOOM-1 uh, trial, uh, is looking at um, a, FG, uh, a, um, a VEGF, FGFR inhibitor drug called Nintentinib, or BIBF-1120. This trial is done, and so we're waiting for events to mature on that. The GOG is developing a, um, a chemo plus PARP trial um, called OVM-1102. That trial, we um, are just about wrapped up on ready, uh, getting the protocol together. It will be submitted um, to CTEP later this year. And right now, the GOG is doing, in partnership with the uh, NGOT group, is doing a, um, a study with an angiopotent inhibitor called um, trabanonib or AMG386, and that trial is also um, uh, in its early stages of, develop, of uh, launching. So the bottom line is that um, we try to figure out our good candidates for surgery. We think that there may be some way to identify these patients outside of um, CT and exam criteria, although that's still um, an experimental, but we try to find good candidates for surgery. But, and when we take them to surgery, we try to do the best job we can to get as much disease out. In terms of adjuvant therapy, I think both the IP and the dose dense are, um, are my favorite options. I use them almost exclusively, but I try to get these patients on, on trial because there's a lot to be learned um, uh, for the, the evaluation of new agents. Now, in the maintenance setting is, you know, when you get patients through six cycles of therapy, the question is, what do you do next? We know that they have a very high rate of recurrence. We know that, um, that more than 50% of these patients will have a recurrence within two years. And that even if we operate and find that there's no visible disease on all of our biopsies, 40% of those patients will recur. That's why we don't do those assessment operations anymore. It's not a very good tool. So we have tried a lot of strategies in phase three studies over the last three decades that have tried different ways to try to impact that impact, impact that time to progression and, and ultimately overall survival by giving something else at the end of that therapy. I just showed you trials with bevacizumab that showed no difference in overall survival. We were able to change PFS, but not overall survival. So we did a series of trials looking at doubling up therapy from primary um, therapy. That was four versus eight, five versus 10, and six versus 12 cycles of frontline therapy. No difference here. We also looked at short duration with non-cross-resistant chemotherapies, high dose, intraperitoneal, interferon, antibodies, biological agents. Um, the first was MMPIs, we also, but I showed you the BEV data, Pacotaxel for six months, a year, and Erlotinib was the latest victim. And you can see that our track record has been terrible. So none of these trials have impacted overall survival. Um, a year's worth of Pacotaxel um, did improve PFS by seven months, but did not improve overall survival, although that trial was underpowered for, for overall survival, and I just showed you the data on bevacizumab. So <clears throat> despite this track record, there's still a lot of interest in trying to do something in that space and trying to find things that don't cause a lot of toxicity. Now, GOG-212 is one of those trials that um, is trying to confirm the overall survival in an appropriately sized trial to assess the role of taxon or taxanes in recurrent set in the um, maintenance setting, and so there's two in this arm. Uh, you can see this is a um, non-blinded, so there's no treatment as a control arm, but then two different taxanes being looked at. Um, and this trial has taken a decade to enroll, but it's um, it's getting close to closing. At ASCO, you're going to hear about pizopinib. Um, I think, and um, hopefully we'll um, hear, hear how that, that was a trial that was done as a randomized uh, phase three versus placebo in the maintenance setting. Um, Trabanonib is being developed right now, and Nintetinib, as I said, is done, and we're, so we're waiting for that. There are several of these other agents out there that are ongoing, and hopefully will um, show some benefit. And I'll talk a little bit about PARP if I have any time at the end. <clears throat> 
So the bottom line for maintenance is that experimental, it's experimental, but there is evidence that PFS may be impacted, but we have yet to show overall survival. I always talk to my patients about maintenance therapy. It's usually the longest conversation I have with them because you have to explain to them that we, the difference between overall survival and progression-free survival, and that's a hard conversation for patients to get their, their heads around. And many of them um, are beat up by the end of six cycles of therapy and don't want more. So um, I can say that overall it's infrequently uh, accepted by patients. Now in the recurrent setting, um, what we know is that nearly all these patients um, will, will um, succumb to progression, um, and we have no home runs in the setting. But we have made a couple um, sacrifices, sacrifice bunts. Typically, the traditional model of therapy is to look at the pa this time interval from six months. Somehow something magical happens in six months that resistant patients then become sensitive patients, and then we change our complete treatment paradigm. Um, I can tell you that the, uh, the data that would support that is very weak. Um, it was made up. We made it up because we came up with the GOG. We needed a queue of platinum-sensitive and platinum-resistant patients, and we said six months looks like the right place. So um, I always say that, you know, I had a patient who came in on a Thursday, on my clinic, Thursday. Um, she was right at her six-month window. She needed a CT scan. It was after a month, so I had to get a new one. Couldn't get it till Monday. She was platinum-resistant. Monday, she was platinum-sensitive. Couldn't put her on study. So um, it's completely artificial. So um, uh, what we do know, and this is probably the best data we have, is that th it's really a spectrum. That is, the longer that patients get away from their completion of primary treatment, the better they do. And it, they do on every metric. And it doesn't even matter what therapy it is. It's response, progression-free survival, overall survival. All of them improve the longer patients are away. So it's an important variable to consider in every trial that we do, but you should know that it's completely arbitrary as to cutoffs. Now, in, the, in this platinum-resistant setting, we have a lot of phase three trials, and you can see the, the uh, track record is also just as bad as it is in maintenance. There are no, you can see overall winners with single agents compared against each other. Topotecan and, and liposomal doxorubicin, or pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, or doxel, are the only two drugs that have a label in this setting. But you can see they were done at uh, essentially being as good as the existing standard. There are two um, trials for which there is a positive result. But in both these trials, the control arm was better than the experimental arm. So um, that has led us with a lot of choices, but no really big, big winners. And there's been one study done that looked at um, a combination with um, liposomal doxorubicin with a drug called trabectidin. This is a study that Dr. Monk um, um, ran and had uh, three different cohorts, one of which was resistant. And you can see there was no difference in, in, in progression-free survival. However, recently we had have one trial that um, showed us some interesting results. And this is the Aurelia trial. This was a trial that was uh, set up as an um, uh, open label trial um, where you had physicians' choice on chemotherapy, chemotherapy plus bevis or chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. This was a, th it's a relatively small trial by, by our standards, um, 361 patients. They were stratified by when they recurred. And the options were weekly pacotaxel, topotecan, and liposomal doxorubicin, or, um, or doxel. And you can see the different schedules that were allowed. And this trial um, uh, recruited um, patients that had the usual spectrum of our recurrent um, kind of cohort. You can see there was very, very infrequent use of, of antiangiogenesis drugs. There were a split of one and two prior regimens. And you can see that the majority of these patients had measurable disease. About a third had ascites. Overall, there was a substantial, nearly doubling in the median progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of less than 0.5, highly statistically significant for chemotherapy plus the biologic bevacizumab. And when they looked across their um, strata and the subgroups, you can see that the effect that there was no particular subgroup that was an outlier. They all seemed to do um, better on therapy uh, with the bevacizumab as opposed to not. And when they looked at responses, you can see that they doubled or tripled, depending on how they were recorded. So this was felt to be a, a very positive trial. They didn't see any new safety signals. Um, it wasn't placebo controlled, um, and it's relatively small. Each of the cohorts had about 120 patients each. So in reality, you're looking at essentially the conglomeration of three randomized phase twos. But it's quite interesting for that um, outcome of progression free survival. So the bottom line is that for platinum-resistant disease, I like weekly pactaxel and bevacizumab. It fits my bias um, because uh, we've studied this in the lab a lot. We has double, um, two different pathways for antiangiogenesis effects, and we know that weekly pactaxel is active in this setting. 
Um, but all of these would be reasonable. I also like gemcitabine and cisplatinum given an acute um, two-week schedule. Um, and I try hard to get these patients on clinical trial because uh, we have, fortunately, we have lots of options. Now, with, um, for platinum sensitive, I'm going to run out of time here, Brad. I'll, um, let, me, let me go through the platinum sensitive and then I'll close there. So one of the questions we had was whether or not you would consider surgery in a platinum sensitive patient. And I'll say the reason we choose that is because that group of patients are sensitive to chemotherapy. So if we, if we looked at the frontline setting as a chemosensitive situation, then the recurrent setting with a long treatment for interval should also be a, considered a potential platinum sensitive setting. Here the, here the bar for, re, for surgical resection is higher. So while before I showed you zero, I showed you over one, one, and zero, here it's clear in every study that's been done that zero does best. In fact, there's very little difference between something visible and nothing visible. And this is just a good example of it in the desktop one study. <clears throat> Here, this is another study that shows essentially the same thing, that, that patients that have any visible residual, even if it's small, they still don't have a significant outcome from surgery. But we have extremely heavy surgical bias. We see a patient two years out, we look at it like a laser surgery. But we have no randomized trial to tell us that's the case. <clears throat> there are many algorithms out there like this, so that case we presented would fall into this group here. Um, you know, 12 to, she was 18 months with two sites, so she would be a decent candidate for secondary site reduction. Fortunately, we've gotten smart. We've tried to get these studies done. The AGO is doing a, a, a study called Desktop 3, which is looking at secondary site reduction. I'm running a trial um, in the GOG, which has taken also a decade to enroll, called GOG 213, which is randomizing patients to surgery or no surgery. And um, right now, that's ongoing still. Um, and the um, uh, Chinese are also doing the same thing. So this is my, I'll, I'll close after this slide, because this is the last, um, this is the slide of the therapeutic options for patients who have platinum-sensitive disease. You can see there are several studies out there addressing the issue. One that I want to draw your attention to, um, or two that I want you to draw your attention to, is the um, um, uh, AGO trial right here, which looked at carboplatinum and gem carboplatinum. This was a trial that was positive for PFS, and it led to the registration of gem carbo in platinum-sensitive patients, and that's why it's used a lot. This trial down here, Oceans, was gem carbo, the same regimen given with plus or minus bevacizumab. And you can see this was positive for progression-free survival, but not, not any different for overall survival. But one thing I want you to, to highlight here, the progression-free survival for the gem carbo winner in the AGO trial was 8.6 months. And in the gem carbo placebo was 8.4 months. So these are very similar patient populations that went into these two studies. But look at the difference in overall survival. 18 months and 35 months. So when I mentioned before about the post-progression survivor shift increasing, this is the cleanest example of seeing that in, the, in a similar patient group of patients. So these patients are living longer, and they're being allowed to be exposed to multiple agents. So take-home message is that PFS is impacted by these um, therapies. You can see it was done in each of these trials. But right now, we have no winner for overall survival, and that's likely affected by the fact that there's multiple treatments past progression. And I'll go ahead and close there. So thank you for your attention. Sorry,